Joe, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just driving an earth electrode into the ground between this gas pipe and this live mains cable in the rain. What could possibly go wrong? Hello and welcome to this Q&A video which is part of our series on the requirements for earthing and bonding laid out in Amendment 2 of BS 7671 and relates to videos we've made on the subject of Schneider circuit protection. So check those out after watching this video and please ignore my chest hair trying to escape my hoodie here. In this video we're focusing on the question, do we need to connect an earth electrode to the earthing on a TN system following a change introduced in Amendment 2? We're all aware of the use of earth electrodes being used for some installations such as lightning protection, generator sets and for TT earthing systems, but regulation 411.4.2 which relates to TN earthing systems now recommends that an additional connection to earth by means of an earth electrode in accordance with chapter 54 is made to the main earthing terminal. So is this new? Well, yes and no. Amendment 1 contained a note to Regulation 411.4.2 that the PE and pen conductors may additionally be connected to earth, such as at the point of entry into the building. Amendment 2 has changed the wording slightly and made it part of the regulation, no longer a note. If we break the regulation down a little, the first key point is, this is a recommendation. Within Part 1 of Amendment 2, there's a section giving guidance on the wording used in the regulations. So while it's therefore not mandated, it is considered to be particularly suitable without mentioning or excluding other options. The next part of the regulation states the electrode must be in accordance with Chapter 54. Here we find a list of what's permitted for use as an earth electrode. From this we can see we're not just talking about rods and pipes, but we could also use tapes and wires, plates, underground structural metalwork in foundations, and welded metal reinforcement of concrete. So why has this been changed and included in the regulation? Well, without knowing what the author of the regulation specifically intends, we can only speculate. The Electricity, Supply, Quality and Continuity regulations, which are referenced in Regulation 114.1, state that it shall be deemed that the connection with earth of the neutral of the supply is permanent. So it's not the consumer's responsibility to ensure the PE or pen conductor is at a zero potential. It may be because we have an ageing network with additional demands being placed upon it. With the relatively recent increase in the installation of electric vehicle chargers, we've all become more aware of the dangers of the loss of the supply neutral or pen conductor and the use of open protection to avoid potential danger. And of course, there's much less incidental earthing to properties as we no longer have as many metal, water and gas pipes entering installations. Those of you who are involved with the installations of electric vehicle chargers will be familiar with the idea of assuming that TNS is TNCS from a design point of view. On a fault-free TNCS system, the voltage between the MET and true earth, that's the earth we walk around on, can be as high as 18.4 volts. A person coming into contact with something connected to the TNCS earth whilst in contact with the true earth may perceive a voltage. The use of an earth rod will help to reduce the voltage between the main earthing terminal and earth and thereby decrease the risk of a significant shock in the event of an open circuit pen conductor in a PME supply. The addition of another earth electrode within the consumer's installation will support the TN system, it won't change it to a TT system. The regulation is very brief and a little vague. It doesn't specify the maximum earth electrode resistance value allowed or the size of the earthing conductor to use to connect it to the main earthing terminal of the installation. For reference, we can look at the note below table 41.5 in BS7671, which state a value exceeding 200 ohms may not be stable. So we do have something we can reference. On its own, like a TT system, the electrode will not provide a low enough impedance path in the event of a fault to enable circuit breakers to operate. So this regulation is not intended to ensure the functionality of all systems in terms of automatic disconnection of supply, but with the move towards RCBOs on the majority of new installations, meeting the values in table 41.5 for the electrode will enable RCDs to operate in the case of an earth fault. The document for public consultation, published prior to Amendment 2 being published, included a section on foundation earthing, which did not make it to the final edition. If this is the intended direction of travel with earthing and bonding, maybe this is a step along that path. As mentioned previously, underground structural metalwork can be used as an electrode, so whereas we currently bond the structure as an extraneous conductive part, maybe in the future we will be connecting it as an additional earth electrode, and the sizing of the cable used may need to be different, a possibly larger size. The introduction of earth electrodes to multiple installations may introduce other concerns regarding positioning. In the event of a fault current flowing to earth, a potential gradient will be generated. 
If the electrodes are too close together or are too close to underground pipework, there is a possibility of introducing a potential into the nearby metalwork. It's essential that earth electrodes are installed correctly and that the area where the electrode is to be installed is thoroughly checked to avoid any damage to other services during installation of the earth rod. Maybe Guidance Note 8, which focuses on earthing and modelling, will become as commonplace with electricians in the future as Guidance Note 3 is for those involved in inspection and testing. Returning to the point raised earlier, this is currently a recommendation. If we look at previous editions of regulations, recommendations do often go on to become requirements when the next amendment or edition is published. Those of us of a certain age may think of the use of RCDs for additional protection, which is now commonplace on most circuits, or the current rise of the AFDD now being required in some areas, but still only being recommended in others. Maybe we'll see an increase in stringency on that as well. The addition of an electrode to a TN earthing system when completing any new work may not currently be essential. However, if this is the direction of travel, it may well help future-proof the installation and correctly installed, it certainly isn't detrimental to the installation. If you'd like to know more about Schneider circuit protection, please check out this video right here, and thank you very much for watching.